Sí. I'm going to take pity on the audience on this side of the house who have had to look over there for the last half hour, so I'll talk from over here. Um, I have no slides. I'm going to talk off the top of the notes. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. This is a huge crowd for, for transmitting these days. Uh, I'm, in a way, part of my job is to rain on the parade of the speakers here because uh, as someone who's been involved in advocacy for improved transit for now four decades since I got started this in 1972, uh, I've seen a lot of plans come and go, I've seen a lot of great ideas, I've seen a lot of, well, less than great ideas, let's just leave it that. Um, from, uh, from planners, from politicians, governments change, uh, people get wonderful ideas that last however long they're in office, and then just as the studies and the engineering ramps up, they're voted out or they leave, and everything turns into a public So uh, that's a very sad situation, and actually uh, it had been hopeful with Metrolinx and their big move plan that we might actually start seeing some regional planning that, that had some, some legs, that would last some period of time. Uh, any of you who have been following the progress of the LRT lines from the point where they were first proposed by the City of Toronto as the Transit City Plan through various delays of the province and the schedule which we just saw here, know that um, the entire network, well half of the network just fell off the map, and the other half has been delayed many years beyond its original uh, proposed ending date. Um, frankly, given the political leanings of the province and where things are going, I would be very surprised if a lot of the stuff that's on the Metrolinx map actually gets built. That's not a very nice thing to say, but there's only so much money to go around. Uh, and that brings me to the issue of funding, which Paul will talk about in more detail later. Um, it's very important uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, the, there's been all the talk of Metrolinx having an investment strategy and the, and the fact, one of the most important things is we need to think about building transit networks, not just building the one line we can afford for the next decade, but actually building a network that moves people around the city. It would be kind of like building the Don Valley Parkway and stopping and saying, okay, what do we do now? Um, Road net, roads, people drive on networks, they don't drive on individual roads in the same way transit use cannot be handled simply by building one line here and there. And yet, because of the financial situation, increasingly we're hearing line-oriented debates. Um, I mean, ironically, it's, it's so funny that with the release of the downtown relief line study last week, Suddenly, everybody's talking about the downtown relief line, and we have to have it right now, or the world will end. <laughs> and I was sent an interesting clipping from the Star by Mike Filey, who many of you probably know, over the weekend, and it was dated December 1982, 30 years ago. <laughs> and the then chief general manager of the TTC, Elf Savage, was talking about the downtown relief line, and how if we did not have this in at the absolute outside 10 years, downtown would come to a complete stop. Okay, so you may have noticed downtown did not come to a complete stop. It's still there, it's still there. And of course the reason it is, is that people get into downtown by many different means. The growth in downtown um, office employment has largely been taken up by Go Transit, rather than by the TTC. Also, conveniently, although I, I dare say a lot of people wouldn't look at it this way, but conveniently for Toronto, there was a recession in the early 1990s. And the result was the TTC lost 20% of its ridership. So that gave them a bit of breathing space for capacity on the transit system as a whole and subway in particular. The problem is we have been back to the point we were around 1990 when the TTC had its last high water mark for ridership and we've broken through that line and we're over 10% above that high water mark now. But, so we're basically in the same period that Al Savage was worried about 30 years ago that he needed the downtown relief line yesterday. 
The problem is all the focus is on building subway lines in Scarborough and in North York and anywhere but downtown Toronto. Um, that's a very difficult situation to be in because yes, people in the suburbs need rapid transit too, but the problem is downtown doesn't go away. Um, for its part, Go Transit, and I'm not sure really this is as much Go Transit's fault specifically as it is the provincial government fault, Go has some wonderful plans for expanding transit service in the region. And indeed, if you look at the Big Move plan, you'll see much, much improved Go train service all over uh, southern Ontario. The problem is it's all subject to funding. And you may have noticed the province is feeling kind of poorly these days. Uh, frankly, they've been feeling poorly for a couple of decades, and Go Transit, Go Transit basically, when someone comes along to them and says, hey, we want you to spend some money, say, we just want to keep the trains we've got on the road, never mind expanding here, there, and everywhere. So there's a really big problem at the provincial level with underfunding, not just of transit locally, but transit on a regional basis. Another important point, when Paul starts talking about the various ways that that we could pick you up by the legs and shake small change out of your pockets in the hope that that will pay for our transit system, is that a lot of the focus has been on capital construction, building new lines like the Eglinton Crosstown line, um, expanding your transit, what I was just talking about. But there is a very substantial need for funding the system we've already got. Just this year, uh, the TTC's budget ask for their, just their operating budget, just the money it takes to run the trains and buses back and forth and, and clean and maintain the vehicles, will probably go up on the order of $40 million to city council. That's just to stay where they are today and absorb the ridership increases that they're getting. That makes no provision for undoing the service cuts that were made over the last two years so that they could get by with the budget cuts that Rob Ford implemented. Uh, it also, there's also a problem that the TTC requires on the order of 800 million to a billion dollars a year for capital maintenance. That's new buses, new subway trains, uh, major repairs to the system like the tunnel repairs that are going on in North Baglinton. Um, that's completely separate from any money to build new lines. Uh, that kind of funding used to come both from the city, from the province, from the feds. But a lot of the programs at the provincial and federal level that funded it have over the years been cut back and one by one they're dying off and more and more of that cost is falling to the city budget. And it's a major problem for the city's capital financing. So enough about money. And I talked about Metro once, which I, I could talk about for a long time. My, my basic complaint about Metro is that they don't pay enough. They're a regional transit agency but uh, there's a lot more that they could be doing if only regional transit were properly funded. Uh, finally, as, as I mentioned, the downtown relief line has suddenly become flavor of the day again. It's not something that we can afford to let fall off the map as so many other things have come along and, and vanished. Because, as I said, we now are looking at ridership growth passing anything that, that Toronto has seen. And there needs to be more capacity in the downtown. If anything, the problem is that phase one that the TTC is proposing is a comparatively small line from St. Andrew subway station at King and University, east and north to Pape and Danford. That's 3.2 billion to do build a subway that long. And frankly, I don't think that's enough because if you're going to really talk about providing relief into the downtown, the line has to go further north, at least to Eglinton. Uh, so that it becomes an attractive parallel service to the young subway to bring people into downtown. That, of course, means even more money. And, you know, I may still be alive to ride the train. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope we don't take that long to build it. You know, we, we can get the whole sort of TTC retirees club out to drive the first thing. I remember, and this was just a plan of the piece of paper. That's, that's the problem. So much of what we've seen, I mean, I've got 40-year-old press clippings that have all of this stuff in them, that have lines to the airport. You know, there was a plan in the 60s to build a line to the airport. I don't know if any of you, how well do you know Kipling Station Bus Terminal? All the buses line up along the north side of Kipling Station Bus Terminal. 
If you look carefully on the other side, there's a nice long glass wall with nothing behind it but a very long, smooth platform. And that's where the line to the airport was supposed to be when the Kipling extension opened. So uh, for those of you who've been waiting to get to the airport, you can just stand there with your transfer. <laughs> Josh, Josh may go to the next slide sometime in the so, so, so as I said, in, in a way, I, I, I come here partly to rain on the parade, but partly to bring a sense of the, the, the context in which a lot of this debate happens. We're talking about a huge amount of money during a period when all governments, the one thing they don't have is money, and they have taxpayers who are really, really unhappy anytime someone says, give me more. So the problem is, you know, whatever we're going to do, justifying it, and then sticking with the plan so that we don't, you know, get halfway done, and as we did on Edmonton once before, and, and stop before the lights really got started. So with that, I'll pass back to Josh and chat with you.